employer service network project because that does complement the employment tie. And then uh, tell you a little bit about our own success factors and hear from you about what's worked for you. And Diane is my head assistant today. Uh, so CASIP, or the Consortium of Agencies Serving Internationally Trained Persons, we go by CASIP because it's way too long. So we're a group of eight independent community-based uh, colleges and agencies who specifically focus on skilled immigrants. So connecting skilled immigrants to employment opportunities that are in their field and that are sustainable. The agencies and colleges work with all kinds of job seekers, but where we come together around CASIP is around the focus of skilled immigrants. We've been working together since 1998 um, on numerous projects, both funded and unfunded. And at last count, at last rough count, about 70,000 newcomers across the eight. And some of our partners like uh, JBS and Costi have been doing it for many, many years. So here are my, our members, as Doug mentioned. And I might ask at this point, anyone here from any of these organizations? A few. Care to introduce yourself at the back? Hi, I'm Amy. <laughs> I work at Access. Employment. I'm Rebecca Newton. I work for uh, Skills for Change in the Flemington Park office. Uh, I'm Rahina Mustak and I write Cost Immigrant Services. Great. And one more? Mm. Two more. Uh, JVS Toronto. I'll be right And at the back. And I'm also with Cost Immigrant Services. Great. So we've got a few of you here. So I might call on you, maybe, <laughs> or you can give your own experience at some point if you uh, have something to contribute. So these are just a few examples of um, the initiatives that CASIP has worked on in the past, just by way of background. Mm -hmm. I won't go into too much depth, um, but often uh, you know, we'll pilot things uh, for the government, we'll do joint professional development, um, visioning, all kinds of things that the group has come together around in the past. Um, I mentioned I wanted to focus on the Employer Services Network project, and I'll just tell you uh, by way of background that this is a two-year Citizenship and Immigration Canada funded project running from April of last year until March of next year. And, um, you know, our focus here is on providing a set of services jointly, a coordinated set of services to employers. So I'll explain what those are and what the selling features are that we use with employers around our partnership. So a full suite of services including recruitment, integration support, uh, pre-screened candidates with in-demand and heart to source skills. These are some of the ways we sell ourselves. But really it's that coordinated access point. So um, we have a group of about 23 job developers who are assigned from the various partner agencies to work specifically on this project. And as a group we meet monthly. Um, I'll tell you about what we do there. But we also have a job sharing website. So our website, CASIF.ca, has a back end where our job developers log in and can post opportunities. So for example, if at Costi there's a job um, and there are just no candidates you know, anywhere in the organization, that job developer would post the opportunity on our internal website. It would send an alert to all the other 23 job developers in the network, and then their clients could, uh, could apply for the job. So what happens is the 23 are the core group and then it sort of filters out. So they would uh, likely be based at a particular site and responsible for that site. So Costi Caledonia, let's say, that person would circulate to all the employment counselors and job developers at that site and then collect the resumes and pull them back up. So that's the kind of you know filtered system that we use for that. In terms of the coordinated point as well, what happens is when we um, meet with employers, say through our advertising campaign or conferences, we will then um, make the introduction by we as the project team to a particular job developer. And then that employer becomes that job developer's main contact uh, for the network and then they post their opportunities and so on. So for employers, it's a great selling feature because they know they can tap into candidates from eight different agencies just by going through one person. And you might have noticed, that he's on the side. What we did is um, we just had a bit of a revamp around our employer materials, and this is a new thing that we've done. We have all our logos on the back, but there's a bit of a space for a business card. So a uh, job developer can go in with their own business card and represent themselves as part of this consortium where all these other agencies are also their partners. 
So that's something new in terms of formalizing partnership and using it as a selling feature for employers. Um, one of the other things that we do uh, as well is training or capacity building. We do try to incorporate a lot of this for our team, and it could be at the meetings or um, special events. So we've done uh, labor market information, using social media for employer engagement. Uh, we've partnered with the sector councils to do a big one-day forum where we invited not just our 23, but as many staff as we could fit in a room at Humber College um, to learn from the various sector councils of what's happening, where are the, the jobs right now. Mm -hmm. um, and now what we're doing, this is kind of interesting because I think anyone can incorporate it at their own organization, um, we're doing sector-specific training in our meetings. So we just launched the first one and we focused on IT. We brought someone from ICTC, which is the Information Communication Technology Council, I think, um, and we brought an employer who had IT jobs. And anyone that's working in employment probably has sort of seen that IT jobs tend to be kind of hot right now. Um, so we brought them in, we asked them to look at resumes, we asked uh, to bring sample resumes, sample jobs, and actually walk us through some of the jargon. Um, so you know, if you don't have an IT specialization, I myself do not know what CA++ is and whether that correlates with, with what. Um, so we had a session like that. It, we planned for an hour, it went for two, but it was really, really valuable. Because uh, the employer, one of the interesting things that he did was he actually laid out all the departments in an organization when it comes to IT and the matching titles and noted where there's overlap. So if you have skills in this area, you could apply for this job. And that was very useful. So we do try to spend a bit of time in, um, in making sure that we're all up to speed in the latest information when it comes to employment. There's also sector specific uh, specialization amongst our job developers. So there are a number of bridging programs. Um, I'll go into them in a second, but these individuals will um, kind of wear that hat at our meetings and share that information and have the best access to those clients. So we do have that, um, that, that we try to work in as well. And um, events. We have found events to be very successful, and particularly when collaborating with other networks. So I'll talk about this in a bit, but just to say um, the West Downtown Lip, when it was the West Downtown Lip, we collaborated with them on a recruitment event where we brought our employers, they brought their employers, we brought our clients, they brought their clients, and we um, focused on three specific sectors, admin, hospitality, and finance, and uh, just did a light pre-screen on the clients, making sure that they fit you know, more or less the opportunities, and did uh, 10 minute interviews. So we had 11 employers from six different organizations, and then we just did a rotating, you know, we set up a schedule, we had 100 clients interviewed, and as a result of that, I think at last count it was 10 people that were hired. So that's pretty good for an event, and all the employers were very happy um, because it saved them time. You know, they may not have hired everyone there, but rather than going through reams of resumes, they had people who kind of fit the bill, and they could just meet them quickly in an afternoon. We did it from, I think, one to four. Um, so that's worked for us. We've also recently partnered with Toronto and Empl uh, Employment and Social Services, the pay um, area, which is the partnership to advance so many acronyms. Um, so they have gone out to get some jobs for youth, and sometimes they'll find mid-level opportunities too. So then they'll reach out to us and say, do you guys have anybody for this? And we'll pull some people together. So that's one of the ways that we've um, partnered externally as well. We're also dipping a toe into technology, and sometimes the uptake is slow, <laughs> but we're trying. So we do have our website, which is our centralized point for our own communication. We have launched a Twitter account now. We are trying LinkedIn, trying to get to LinkedIn. Um, we have an employer hotline. Interestingly, we found we get many more employer leads through our website than the phone. That should say something, I think. But we also use Box.com. So Skills for Change had a license for Box.com, and they allowed the entire network to use it. So that's now a place that's cloud technology where we can uh, put all our joint documents together, everyone has access, we're not emailing stuff back and forth. So that's very good use as well. Um, so those are the things that we do in a coordinated uh, way together, but I just wanted to kind of make it clear that each of the individual organizations operates on their own and has bridging programs, has a full suite of employment Ontario services, 
uh, language training, all of these uh, various other um, things that they offer to clients, and that's what makes our clients sort of, you know, exceptional and job ready, and then together we can promote them to employers. Um, in case you're interested, this is how we structured ourselves. So we have the overall CASIP group, which is completely in kind. This is the group that have been working together for 14 years um, on these various initiatives. <coughs> then for our own project, we have a steering committee. And then here's the project team, which is myself, a coordinator and an administrator, who are joint for two projects. And I'm talking about this one today. And then at that level is where we try to connect to the other networks. Um, as best we can, and then TRIAC. So this, um, if anyone is familiar with the employer toolbox from way back when, so there, there are many things in that toolbox, and one of them was this um, job developers network. So we've taken that on and are uh, growing it. So TRIAC sits on our steering committee. Um, they also join our JD meetings, TRIAC, the Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. Um, and then here is where we have all our 23 job developers, and I think we should actually have little arrows because these people are just are the liaisons, the core group, but all of the different staff in the agencies are actually a part of CASIP, right? It only works if the information flows in two directions and we have uh, participation from everyone. So, and then we're funded by CASIP. Uh, a few of our successes. So, over 200 employers referred into the network. So these are employers that we might meet at events or, um, that are new to us, or they might be employers who um, are referred in through the various job developers. You can see the numbers there. A lot of positions and a lot of people with increased access to opportunity. <coughs> and I, I think I already mentioned uh, our last recruitment event there. Okay, so I know this group knows a, a lot about partnerships. So before, I kind of go into what we identify as our success factors. I wanted to hear from this group. What what are the things that have worked in the past for you as you're building partnerships? What are those kind of must-have ingredients that you've experienced? Time. That it can't be rushed. <laughs> or have a, a timeline put on it. I think I said that we've been working together since 1998. <laughs> Right, and it, uh, I hope I haven't misled you to think that it's perfect, right? Because there are still obviously challenges. Yeah. And also a clear goal what you're trying to accomplish. That's clear very goal. important because a lot of times we sometimes you know some partnerships are being done, but maybe not everybody is on the same page as to what is the ultimate goal, what is the vision and mission of the partnership. So two things: a clear goal and one that everybody understands, right? One that's communicated. set a, a communication strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a recognition of mutual benefit to the partnership mm -hmm. is actually really important as well. Yeah, recognition of mutual benefit. your thoughts are on that. Another thing around coordination is alignment. So I mentioned that this only works if not just the group of 23 <laughs> are participating, right? We actually need alignment between what the individual eight organizations say and what, what we say as CASIP. And that needs to flow through from staff to supervisors to leaders um, and the <coughs> procedures as well. Um, we also found that in terms of coordination, a tool helped. So having the website as a tool where we can all gather and put information in one place. 
I talked about job postings, but on that website we also have events. So say there's an um, uh, info session for a bridging program coming up at Access, the JD responsible for that can post that, and then everybody knows that's happening. And those emails can always be forwarded to clients, to distribution lists, um, you know, whatever. So that has also helped having the tool for us. And resources are also posted on that page, so events and resources. Um, so we mentioned the tool. Uh, in terms of collaboration, having a collaborative mindset, a commitment, a willingness to actually engage in this kind of work um, as well helps. And again, that would be at all levels. Sorry, my <coughs> phone is very small. I want to make sure I get them. Uh, commitment, I mentioned, and ongoing participation. So people actually need to actively collaborate rather than just say it. We've also found that external collaboration breeds our internal collaboration. So collaborating with uh, TRIAC, um, TESS, all these other organizations helps us collaborate ourselves. You know, internally it feeds our own processes. Uh, leadership, senior leadership, champions, leadership at the supervisor level um, as well, very important. Quality. So to that end, you know, your uh, comment about the vision, we have uh, protocols in place and they're really, you know, quite precise. Um, so having something that everyone is aware of in terms of how the work should function, having targets for how much work should happen, um, having ongoing monitoring of that and ensuring that it's happening, the quality assurance piece as well we find important and uh, ongoing capacity building. So having those sessions to make sure that everyone is working optimally um, also helps. And then it's all underpinned by trust, and that's where I see communication flowing into it, um, good working relationships and that willingness to share. So all those we found very important to us, yes. Um, I also just wanted to highlight a couple of best practices. I know I talked about a lot of these, but just so you have one slide. Um, talked about stakeholder roles and responsibility being cleared and communicated. Uh, we found that formal collaboration has been working well for us. So having protocols and a partnership agreement that executive directors signed, and in that partnership agreement is where we have the roles and responsibilities delineated, and that circulated amongst everybody. Training and professional development being centralized so that everyone's getting a consistent message so that one organization doesn't think an IT resume looks great like this, and another one think it looks great like this. And this is something we're working on. I wouldn't say it looked like there. Cultivating team spirit and uh, having the in-person meetings works well for us as well, because people get a chance to sit face to face. And sometimes at those meetings, honestly, it's, I have this client, I'm not sure what to do. It's a bit of a, let's share our issues and try to work through them together because you have 20 colleagues there who are doing something very similar and bringing different experiences from their own organizations. Having responsibilities integrated into performance measurement and job descriptions and I should say and recognition opportunities, right? So um, the old idea that if it's not um, tracked, it's not done, if it's not measured, you know, there's a saying there. Um, we do find that that is helpful, and again, we haven't gone there 100%, but that's something that we're working on or towards. Um, we do find it, as I mentioned, beneficial to have connections with other organizations as well. The in-person stuff, the events, has been very successful for us. Getting employers face-to-face -face with the candidates, networking, mentoring, whatever, in a room, it just <coughs> seems to work. Because as soon as you meet that person, they fly off the page. So that's, uh, that's been good. Any decision that I make, I ask at least three groups <laughs> most of the time, and the JD is always being the first one. So we're always asking what works for you, what do you need, what do you need? And so having that kind of involvement is really helpful for us. And then being flexible, responsive, because you know our environment is constantly changing, and um, you need to kind of be aware of what's going on and be ready to change with it. So those are the ways that you can reach us. As I mentioned, we are now tweeting. This we're still working on. Um, what, what I wanted to, to know from this group, I guess, is that 
you know, we found that this formal network is working for us. But sometimes we think, would it be better if it was more loose? Um, so if we didn't, you know, have um, these kind of strict procedures where we need to put everything on the site, everything needs to be tracked, everyone's managers need to be CC'd so they see how many, you know, whatever was done. Because it certainly takes a lot of person hours to do that kind of follow-up. So I, I'll put the question out to this group. The networks that you've been involved with or in or the partnerships, have you found that having a loose sort of flowing partnership has worked well for you? Or do you find that when things are really more structured and everyone knows exactly what to expect, it's been more successful? It's a bit of a thinker, so you don't have to answer right away. And if you have questions or if I haven't uh, covered anything, you're welcome to ask now too. I think that um, if the you know relationships are built on I trust, like you say, um, so there's a lot of things in terms of what people do when they collaborate in terms of organizations. Um, I, I would say that mostly it's just in terms of policies and procedures that probably you know need to take that formal level, um, but interaction you know maybe. It has to be a little bit loose um, because people have different styles, um, clients have different styles as well, mm -hmm. and that would certainly benefit. But but keeping restrictions and, and doing things very formally um, is going to take up a lot of hours and you're not really getting a whole lot done. So yeah. it's very slow. Part of it depends on the amount of resources that you have, right? So I mentioned our funding year is ending. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just kind of curious about. <coughs> what other shapes the network could take if it didn't, it, or if it couldn't look the way it does. Uh, another option to keep in mind is a level of understanding between the management and the people who are actually working on this partnership, even within every organization. Absolutely. Because a lot of time, it may seem a good idea in a presentation on an hour on a bigger forum that yes, let's become member. <laughs> without ever realizing that what kind of commitment you are asking or you are ready to make for your frontline staff who will be actually participating in that. So it's, it's okay to have a, a more fluid relationship if everyone understands rules and responsibilities very clear, which is still utopia. So if you are realistic, it may be, more, it may be better to have a more formal relationship in which there is a commitment from the management of the organization in understanding that what kind of resources they will be putting out there to make it work. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of time it starts very well, but once they understand that how much commitment their frontline staff is going to do and they have this whole lot of other things for them to do, it starts falling apart. So at that point, it's easy to go back and uh, uh, without everyone making read the fine print, but still you can say, you know, we are committed to do it, so let's keep it up that way, versus uh, not having an option of doing that. Yeah. And you raise a very good point, because um, the there's eight different organizations in CASA, and they probably have, I'll get this wrong, but 25 sites, you know, at least. Costi itself, I think, has 10. 10. 17. Oh, then I definitely got it wrong <laughs> because I know Access has five. Skills for Change probably has five. I mean, there's over 30. And so ensuring that everyone in all of those different locations is aware of CASIP, is aware of what we're doing, and their own ability to contribute is very tricky. Um, I didn't, I don't think I mentioned, but what we just, we did a slight revamp of our website too, and what we just put up there is, um, a spreadsheet of all the different locations and the bridging programs that are at those locations, the language programs and the mentorship programs, um, their addresses and which ones offer employment Ontario services. Um, so clearly I haven't memorized that list, but it is up there. So if you ever wanted to take a look at it in terms of client referrals or for yourself or whatever, you're welcome to look at it under resources on the CASIP website. Yeah, so there's the, the point there of, um, communicating in two directions, right, from staff and management and so on. Yeah. Uh, just a question. Um, for, there's a lot of agencies that are not in CASA, mm -hmm. uh, one of the organizations. Um, if you're referring a client, I mean, they have their own entity with, in their organization, say, CASA has their own employment, right? 
So how does it connect to, like, how do you connect one of your clients to Casa Exact, like, directly? Um, because when the client goes in, I don't know if they ever hear of it, are they just stuck, you know, um, doing the employment programs in a particular organization? Or they, do they ever get to CASIP? How do they hear about it? Yeah, so CASIP is, um, you know, in some ways meant to be working in the background, right, of things. So for clients receiving employment services, and you, some of you that work in this area know that, you know, you're, for Employment Ontario, registered with one agency and you're not going to another one, right? Um, so, but they can enroll in bridging programs at other organizations without that EO kind of mess. Um, but what would happen is if there's a job that their counselor sees as suitable on CASIP for them, then they would connect them to that job, send it to them. So that's on the job front. On the other front, um, the counselors and job developers should be aware as part of CASIP of all the bridging programs that are available and then can refer clients to those specific bridging programs without referring them out of EO employment Ontario. I guess follow up question, would yeah. it be possible to open it up to other agencies so that yes. you know they can refer clients and they can give jobs as well that they find? It seems that it's great for those organizations, yeah. but I feel like I feel like I want to have my client access to it too. But through you guys, sure, so yeah. that's okay. But open it up a little bit. Yeah. So in terms of bridging programs, definitely your clients can participate in bridging at any organization. It's I don't think there's any restriction on that. So check out that um, document or ask me for a connection if you have something in mind. But in terms of jobs, this is another area that we are looking at and we have not figured out. So um, that's why I asked why, whether, part of the reason why I asked whether formal or loose makes more sense. Um, because right now, in terms of our website and the structures and all of that, it only applies to the eight organizations that we're working with. CASIP membership is expanding, it's not, the announcement hasn't been made, so I won't say more than that, um, but that doesn't even matter. It's about those other organizations that are there that are not a part of CASIP, and it, it may not make sense for them to do that, right? It is a huge commitment in terms of time for management and staff. So, you know, uh, that's what we're trying to figure out, is how do we engage with other organizations? So often other networks will approach us about doing events together, um, and that's the way we've done it so far. But if someone has a great solution about how to tap into that, because without, so if you think about the fact that we have all these protocols and processes in place that wouldn't, of course, apply to other organizations. So we've had some thinking about, but certainly haven't come up with an answer to how to collaborate with every other organization out there, if you have a good solution. I'm all.